Howdy, Central. Give you three numbers. One, 17, and 48. That's not your lottery. I don't even know how many numbers you need for the lottery. I figure I don't play it. My odds are just the same as those who do. Um, one, the number one, that's the youth minister that you have, the number one. Kobe Duran is as fine a youth minister as I have ever worked with. <laughs> 17, that's how many eighth grade girls stayed at our house this weekend. <laughs> Hi, y'all. If I have to stay awake, you do too. <laughs> We had the most delightful time with these young ladies. They were so great and fun and just, they were just a delight to be around and it was a great time and, and there were four leaders there. And I have to tell you, one of the leaders said something I will never forget. She said, I can quote her on this. Eva said, Pastor Mike, you and Terry are the best. So I'm really happy about that. 48, this is the 48th book of the Bible, the book of Galatians. We've been journeying, we started with number one, which is Genesis, we've been going all the way through. We have 18 left after this Sunday, of course, culminating in the book of Revelation. And just so you know, it's the book of Revelation. Notice what I didn't say. There's no book of Revelations. It's the book of Revelation, and we'll get there. But we're in Galatians today, and I want to say something to those of you who, who aren't members of Central and you're here today, and man, maybe you're just looking for that perfect church. Sorry to disappoint. Central's as great a church as I've ever been in, but it's not a perfect church, and if you're looking for the perfect church, you can't find it. You won't find it. It doesn't exist. You know why? Because there's knuckleheads like me in there. There's people in there, and people are not perfect. There's not one. Here's the great thing about being in church, though, is we love each other in spite of our flaws. Not only that, we, we sometimes love each other just because of the flaws, because we can relate to one another, and we can identify with each other, and we have, we have the bond knowing that we have all been forgiven in Christ Jesus, and that brings us together and unites us. So if you're looking for a church like that, that's great. But you know, even in the Bible, you don't find any perfect churches. The last two weeks, we looked at the two letters that we have that Paul wrote to the Corinthian churches, and, and we saw what a mess they were. I mean, here in, in Corinth, the church was just a mess with disunity and impurity, and this week he's writing a letter to, to the churches in, in the region of Galatia. And, and what we see there is they weren't really so much struggling with that kind of thing, but they were dealing with doctrinal error and what had happened is that somebody was tampering with the gospel of Jesus Christ and they were changing it to suit their own ends. I want you to consider what's going on, but look at, let me give you a little background. Let's look at this map. Just so you know what you're talking about, you see this region right up here in the middle, it says Galatia. This is where you see in the far west part of Galatia, Antioch in Pisidia, not to be confused with over here in the east, southeast, Antioch in Syria. And so what happened is Paul and Barnabas were sent on their first mission trip. They were in the church of Antioch, the very first real sending church for missionaries. And Paul and Barnabas set off and they went to the island of Cyprus and, and then they, they wound up going up to Antioch in Pisidia and they preached the gospel in the synagogue there. And, and a lot of the people of the town led by some of the Jews did not like it and they ran them out of town. So they went to the, the city of Iconium that you can see there in this smaller region called Lycon and they were in Iconium and they said, hey man, we don't like what you're saying because some of the Jews and some of the non-Jews were embracing Christ and so they decided to stone Paul. Well, well, Paul and his companions left and they went down to Lystra and in Lystra, they, they didn't get away so easily because some people came from Iconium and from Antioch and Pisidia. I want you to see how ruthless they were and how relentless they were in tracking down to put an end to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they carried Paul and Barnabas outside the city of Lystra and they stoned Paul to death, they thought. They left him in a bloody, heaping, bruised, and broken mass. And when he came to, he went back in the city and started preaching the gospel some more. And then he went down to Derby and preached the gospel there and then went back through Lyconia, or Lystra and Iconium and Antioch and Pisidia and over to, back to uh, Antioch and Syria. Let's, let's take another look just so you can see the region we're talking about. You see where Italy is and in the south you see Egypt. That's the northern coast of Africa. So I just want you to get, you, want you to get the picture 
of the area we're talking about. So Paul started these churches in 46, 47, somewhere around that year. And so when he writes this letter to the churches in Galatia, it's maybe a year, two years at the most later. It's, it's pretty fresh, and they've already developed some doctrinal error. As you know, Paul liked to go to the synagogues first because he's, he's preaching a Jewish message. That's what Christianity is. It's a, it's a Jewish message. I mean, we're talking about the Messiah, the Savior of the world that the Jews had been longing for for so long, and, and that is Jesus. So Paul is, is doing that, and so a lot of the Jewish leaders got mad. So what happened is some false teachers had sprung up. And by the way, that's still a threat today. There's so many false teachers out there, and we have to be on our guard about that. And that's why at Central, we're very, very concerned about knowing our doctrine and being accurate with our doctrine because it matters. And so what happened is some of these folks were, it seems like, maybe trying to make peace with the Jewish people who didn't like them. They said, no, 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 no. Here's what we're going to do. You believe in Jesus and keep the Old Testament law. And primarily what they were doing is they were telling people believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised. Now, you can imagine that that caused quite a stir, telling people they had to be circumcised in order to follow Jesus. And so that's what's going on there. And so Paul is writing this letter because he is absolutely stunned that some of the people that had embraced the gospel are falling for this. I want you to see what he says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. He says, I'm astonished. That you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That, that word accursed means cursed by God, condemned to hell. Somebody comes preaching a different gospel to you, even if it's an angel from heaven, he should be condemned for eternity. Verse 9 is, we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. There's only one gospel. Paul is going to great lengths here to make sure that they understand there's only one gospel. To tamper with it, any deviation renders it not a gospel. It renders it worthless, and it renders its teachers damnable. This is really, really, this is not a matter of just splitting hairs. This is not ivory tower kind of stuff. Paul is saying this matters. This eternity is on the line here. So in the book of Galatians, the first four chapter, we would say that's the gospel defended, where Paul is defending and making a case for the gospel that he originally preached to them. And since he's preaching to these people that had, that had had this Jewish type heresy come into the church, he uses a lot of Old Testament examples. He's using their scriptures and their heroes of the faith to illustrate that even the people in the Old Testament knew that salvation didn't come from keeping the law. And then chapters 5 and 6 is the gospel experience. In other words, once you have embraced the gospel, now what are you supposed to do? And you remember, we've talked about this before, about how Scripture grounds imperatives and indicatives. And what that means is the imperatives, the commands, only make sense after the indicatives, the theology. A lot of times we go to Scripture and we go, well, I want to know what to do. The first thing you need to know is what to believe because what to do isn't always going to make sense until it's grounded in what you believe. So we have the gospel defended, and then we have the gospel experienced. So I want to focus on passage for, for most of the remainder of our time here that encapsulates really the entire book. And, and these are the truths that just poured fuel on the Protestant Reformation. Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. Paul says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Let me stop there for a second. He's being a, a little bit facetious. He says, look, we're Jews too. We're the ones who've kept the laws. We aren't like those Gentiles out there. Paul was a Pharisee. He kept the law as well as anybody. He says, look, we're Jews too. We're not like all those sinners. But look what he says in verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, look, we have kept the law. Not like those people out there that didn't keep the law, but we all come to Christ in the same way. And when he's talking about being justified, he's talking about being declared not guilty by God. He's talking about being made right with God and not being condemned by God. So he says, we know that a person is not justified, made right with God by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. 
So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God for his righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Really, Galatians, the bulk of Galatians is about justification being made right with God. There is nothing more important on this planet than knowing how to be made right with God. Now, not everybody likes to hear that. You know why not everybody likes to hear that? Because there's an implication. And the implication is that you're not right with God. Some people don't like to hear that. I remember sharing the gospel one time with, a, with an older couple. He was a, a Jewish atheist, and she was a professing Christian of a, of a different denomination, and we were talking, and so I start sharing the gospel with her husband. And I start talking about how all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And she goes, no, let me stop you right there. I've never sinned in my life. It's a woman in her 70s. She's doing pretty good, right? That's the first time, frankly, I'd ever heard that. And I, I, I said, what? She goes, I've never sinned. Why are you saying people have sinned? I've not sinned. I've never done anything wrong. I said, you've never done anything wrong? She says, no, I'm perfectly fine with God. I've always been fine with God. I've never done anything for God to be unhappy with me. I to, it totally threw me. Now I can't give hope to her because she doesn't think she needs hope. I got a letter one time, day after a funeral. A young woman had died just tragically and got a really angry letter from a relative of hers who's an atheist. And what he was so mad about is that we had the audacity to use the phrase referring to this girl as a sinner saved by grace because she had never sinned and the concept of sin is one of these religious ideas that just ruins people's lives. But the reality is we're all in the same predicament because we're all sinners and the truth is in the depth of your heart, you know you are, don't you? You know you are and you know you need to be forgiven. We all need to be made right with God and regardless of what your concept of deity, regardless of, of how somebody views salvation, there are essentially three theories of how a person is saved or how a person is made right with God. First, should we have faith in our own merit? Is it faith in our own merit that makes us right with God? In other words, let me just tell you that aside from biblical Christianity, every other religion in the world is here. Every other religion in the world, whether it's, it's a personal God or a force, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or whatever, there is something you need to do to be made right in some way, and it depends on your own merit. It can be keeping religious ritual. It can be doing all of the things that your religion demands of you. Um, it may just be that you, the, the religion teaches that you have to do a lot of good works, that you have to do the good to make up for the bad, or it could be grounded in morality, that it's all about being a good person. But all of this is a law of some kind because there's some sort of standard that has to be met, right? Whether it's a religious standard or a good work standard or a moral standard, there's a standard to be met. It's rules, it's standards. And Paul says in Galatians 2.16, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we've also believed in Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul addresses this as clearly as I think would be humanly possible. So should we have faith in our own marriage? Should we have faith in Jesus? Friends, this is what the whole Protestant Reformation was about. This is why there is Protestantism today. You might remember some of you, we've talked about these Latin phrases before, sola gratia and sola fide, grace alone, faith 
alone, in Christ alone is the cry of the Reformation. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ has done everything necessary. The word gospel is good news. The news is that Jesus has done everything necessary to secure our salvation. He lived the perfect life because we can't. He was the perfect substitutionary sacrifice suffering on our behalf because we can't. And he did something none of us can do. He defeated the grave. It couldn't hold him. He walked out three days later. That's the good news. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. That's it. And by faith, when we talk about faith, we're talking about placing all your trust in Jesus and nothing else, including not trusting your own efforts. But here's another theory, which is a synthesis of these other two, and that's faith in Jesus plus something. This was the teaching in Galatia. Yeah, you need to believe in Jesus and get circumcised and keep these feasts and these festivals and do these things. But you, yeah, faith in Jesus is, if you don't have faith in Jesus, you, it's not good enough but faith in Jesus plus something. This again is what, what sparked or fueled the Protestant Reformation because Roman Catholic doctrine, and by the way, I'm, I would never speak negatively about Roman Catholics or anything like that. If I were here with a priest, he would go, yeah, he's, he's describing that exactly right. They have actually ruled that what we believe is anathema, which is the same word for cursed here. In fact, the Greek word there, anathema. So the Roman Catholic Church says, what I'm teaching today is damnable heresy, okay? Because they believe you have to have faith in Jesus and you have to keep the sacraments and you have to do good things and then you go to purgatory so that you can atone for your own sins in purgatory. And we say, no, it is grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone. He is sufficient to save us from our sins. By the way, some Baptists fall into this camp, and I hear it. What do you think it takes to get to heaven? Well, you gotta believe in Jesus and be a good person. I hear Baptists say things like, man, I'm just trying to make it to heaven someday. Stop trying to make it to heaven and trust Jesus. He's done it for you. Paul says when you add anything, anything to faith in Jesus, you no longer have the gospel of Jesus. Galatians 2, 19 to 20, for through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is about Paul dying to the life of self-justification. This is about Paul no longer living or attempting to living by his own righteousness. Instead, his life is by faith and through faith in Jesus. No longer is he striving to attain justification. He's received justification as a gift of God by faith. And not only is he justified, but he experiences the life the law never gave because he has Jesus in him. And that brings us to the next question. And that's the question of living in the gospel, what does it mean when he says, I live to God? He means the law can't save me and I can't keep it. But he says in verse 17, but we're still found to be sinners. So what is a Christian life supposed to look like? And this is where we move from justification, which is being made right with God, to sanctification, becoming like Jesus. It's important not to get these two backwards. We don't have to become like Jesus so that we can be made right with God. We're made right with God so that we can begin to be made like Jesus. It's a lifelong process, y'all. We're working on it, okay? But not for our justification. So we first have to acknowledge a reality that was articulated during the Reformation by the Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator. There's an R on the end of that, by the way. Simul justus et peccator. And what does that mean? Anybody speak Latin? At the same time, so where we get our word simultaneous, at the same time, justified and sinners. At the same, I told you you're not going to find another church because it's full of sinners. It's full of sinners who've been justified, but sinners nonetheless. You remember Romans chapter 7 from a few weeks ago? How Paul says, oh, I keep doing the things I don't want to do and the things I want to do I don't do. <coughs> 
Even though we sin, we do not lose right standing with God. <coughs> Once you are justified, nothing you do makes you unjustified. Once you're right with God, you can't undo that. That's why, you know what, there's no such thing as a former Christian. You ever hear these testimonies, oh, this former Christian's gonna give a testimony. Nope. Former churchgoer, former religious guy, but no, 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 once you are in Christ, you don't come out of Christ. Jesus says, I will lose none. How many is none, by the way? I will lose none that the Father gives me. They're in my hand and I'm in the Father's hand. <coughs> That's a dangerous message because people always ask, so it's okay to sin then. I can do whatever I want to since I'm saved by faith. I can do whatever I want to. But a truly justified person understands that if you have truly saving faith, you have new life. Verse 20 says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul's saying, I'm not the same guy I used to be. Not only am I no longer trying to justify myself, but I'm living in a way that pleases God, much, much the way a child lives to please God. Not to, not to become your child. Think about this. My dad died when I was 51 years old. Up until the day he died, I longed for his pleasure. And I had it, by the way. I wasn't trying to earn my dad's favor. I wasn't, tr I wasn't hoping one day I'd get to be a child of my father. I had this sweet, wonderful relationship with my dad, almost, the way a father-son relationship ought to be. But nothing pleased me more than pleasing him. As a 51-year-old man, I wanted my dad. I would go visit my dad, and I'd meet his friends, and they'd go, oh, your dad's so proud of you. I'm like, mm-hmm. I got all A's. <laughs> that's the way, that's the way. We don't earn God's favor, but we want to live in a right relationship, and we want to please him. And we can do this because we're in Christ, and he's in us. We become spirit-filled. The rest of Galatians 2.20 says, And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By the way, we're about to flip over to Galatians 5 if you're following along in your Bible. But hear this. We're not just saved by faith. We live by faith. We're not just saved by faith. We live by faith because we're right with God. Because we're no longer trying to earn God's favor, because we're no longer trying to justify ourselves, because we have new life, because Christ lives in us, we are now free to work out our salvation. Not work for our salvation, but to work out our salvation in the freedom of the Spirit of God. Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't become enslaved by a law-based salvation. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Freedom isn't a license to indulge our sin for desires. It is freedom to serve God more and serve others more. Galatians 5.16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now what does he mean by that? Walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. He tells us, 5.17, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evidence, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, these kinds of things are not the mark of the Christian life. So somebody says, yeah, I'm a Christian and I do all these things. I would say, how do you know you're a Christian? Where's the new life? So holy living is not unimportant, and grace is not an excuse to avoid holiness, but rather true saving faith produces good works that come from the inside. Look at this. It goes deep. 522. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So here, we're already to our takeaway. And it's a question for you. Are you living a life of law, license, or liberty? Are you living a life of law, license, or liberty? If you're living a law, life of law, that means you're living in such a way that you hope someday you're good enough to get into heaven. You might even believe in Jesus, but you still think your goodness contributes in some way to your salvation. If you're living a life of license, you think it just doesn't matter how you live. Could be that you just think everybody's going to go to heaven, so it doesn't really matter. Well, except all the really bad people, you know, like Hitler. Or maybe you think that since you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter how you live. But if you're living a life of liberty, that means you're walking by faith and experiencing the joy of the outworking of the Spirit in your life. You're not perfect yet. You still stumble. You still fall. But you now hate sin and you love holiness. And you can see real changes in your life from the inside out because you're free in Christ and that compels you to love him and serve him more. Let me illustrate it like this. I want to give you a tale of two dogs. I want to tell you about the worst dog I ever had and I want to tell you about the best dog I ever had. The worst dog I ever had, his name was Chase. We had no idea how prophetic that name was going to be for him. I chased that dog so much. Now Chase... Liked to be outside, but he didn't like being in the backyard. The backyard had a fence around it. When Chase was in the backyard, he always wanted outside. You headed to the gate, man, Chase was trying to get out the gate. And if he got out the gate, oh, here we go. And I'm chasing him. I can't tell you how many times I chased this dog down the street and around the block, trying to get him to come home. It was that dog. <laughs> so here's the thing. When Chase was in the yard, in the fence, that fence was the law for him. He didn't want to be fenced up. He wanted outside the fence, but the fence kept him in. That's what the law does to you. The law is a yoke of slavery. It is bondage. It keeps you hemmed in against your will. But when Chase got out the gate, he lived a law of license. I'm free. The last time I saw Chase was the backside of Chase. He got so far, I had to trek back home, get in the car. I drove around for an hour looking for that animal. Collins Drive, Burleson, Texas. I don't know what happened to Chase. But you know what? Chase didn't get to come in at night and be warm. Chase didn't get all the food he needed. Chase didn't get the love and companionship. Because he thought, man, I can just do whatever I want now. And it, I'm telling you, it cost him. But I want to introduce you to Honey Bell. <laughs> Best dog ever. She's 14. Terry took that picture this weekend. She's deaf. We sneak up on her all the time. We don't even mean to. She can barely see. She's got cataracts. She doesn't move very well. And she's just sweet. She was the best dog. Let me tell you, that dog could sniff out a ball anywhere. Now, Honey Bell, you let her ride out in the front yard. And you know what she did? She stayed in the front yard. Because that's home. That's where she belonged. That's where good things happen. Now, I'd take her running. I'd put her on the leash. We'd go run five, seven miles, and boy, she'd stay right with me. If she started to get out in the street, you know what you do? <whistles> Here she comes. She comes right back. Not because she fenced in by law. But with her liberty, with her liberty, she got to experience more life and enjoy the life and the safety and the security of her home. What about you? Are, are you living by law? If you're all fenced in and you're just trying and hoping someday, stop. You're striving today and come to Jesus and be set free of the bondage. And if you're li living a life of liberty, doing whatever you want, how's that really working out for you, honestly? 
I hear these people, oh man, it's going to be a big party in hell someday. No, no, no. Hell, to hell is not cartoonish. Hell is eternity and it's awful. And you're not with your buds. You're not living it up with Satan. Satan doesn't rule hell. God does. Satan is, is a prisoner there. Outer darkness is how Jesus described hell. Eternal fire is how Jesus described hell. Anguish forever and ever is how he described hell. Ain't it fun? It's really not. And you know what? You don't even have to get there to know that. So if you're living a life of liberty, of, of license, would you come by faith to Jesus and experience what life is? Because liberty is wonderful. Liberty is free. Liberty is joyful. Liberty is holy, and it's righteous, and it's good, and it's life-giving. Here's the thing. You're either living life without Jesus, or you're living life with Jesus. And if you're not living life with Jesus, would you turn it around today and come to him? Let's pray. Holy Father, we are thankful that we have been set free from the bondage of law and rules, but not so that we can go do whatever we want, but so that we can know the freedom of experiencing a life of holiness in relationship with you. So Father, for those who are trying to be good enough to get to heaven, I pray that today they would just stop striving and come and find rest in you. For those who are trying to find life and doing all the fun, great things they can do, but they keep coming up empty, I pray that they would come to you and find real life. Father, we're thankful that Jesus did everything necessary. Help us embrace that truth and live in the freedom of the gospel every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.